Hello, this is the Ralph Bevins Project. I'm Ralph Bevins. We're here today with Mark Davis of Davis Commercial. And he's uh, he knows a lot about Houston. He knows about a lot about what's happening in the inner loop of Houston. He's uh, And he went to school there. He's a Rice University grad, and now he runs a company called Davis Commercial. And you probably see his signs on a lot of properties uh, in, inside the loop uh, in the Montrose area. Midtown, all over, um, and he's he's uh, he knows what he's talking about. So, Mark, thank you so much for taking time to talk with us today. Thanks for having me, Ralph. You've already put me on the spot by saying I know what I'm talking about, but I'll do my best. <laughs> you too. Well, I know you've done a lot of work. Uh, you know, a lot of work in, in Lower West Timer and other areas where the you know, restaurants are very much primary tenants or they're all over the place. Uh, and of course with the pandemic, it's tough. So how would you tell us, tell us about what's going on in the restaurant and, and related retail to that? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. It's almost sort of a case of the haves and the have nots. Um, I think the restaurants that were struggling before COVID, this was just sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. And I think that's true for retailers in general. So those folks um, probably will come back, but at the same time, you know, in the past six or seven months, really since COVID started, there's been several restaurant leases signed in Montrose, particularly in second generation spaces, which obviously has more appeal because it's cheaper for the restaurants to come in. But, uh, you know, I can name four or five. I mean, you know, the Acme Oyster House that went into the old uh, El Rey space, and that was a pretty big deal. And then um, we signed a couple of leases in the past three or four months and a couple of the centers. We lease uh, ones at Montrose and Hawthorne, where the Starbucks is. I'm going to completely get the name of the, it wrong. It's called Lao Shi Xuan, I think, but it's a Chinese restaurant of Chicago. Really? Supposedly the best Chinese food in Chicago. Um, cool. One of the big attractions was because the Chinese consulate was next door. But unfortunately, as we know, that changed a little bit. But I think they'll still do well. Um, we signed a restaurant with this little, uh, we signed a lease with this space called, uh, or this restaurant called the Seafood Connection on Montrose, um, just east of Westheimer. They're out of North Carolina. They're building out right now. Really? Southern Yankee Brewery, which is a craft brewery uh, and sort of specialty food. They went into the old Good Dogs on West Alabama. That lease was just signed a couple weeks ago. We did that deal. Okay. Uh, Brutus is opening, I'm sure you saw. And then um, we have an LOI uh, signed with Jenny's Ice Cream, which is a super high end ice cream um, retailer. So, yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean, it's been tough for some people yet. Um, uh, I think it's sort of like the strongest survive and then it's so desirable. There's a lot of people who I think understand that, Hey, this wasn't a, a forever deal and prices have gotten a little better. So it was an opportunity for people to come in and take advantage of that. I think. And the week, the week got weaker and the, the, the strong survived and now they're out making an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. What, what about from the, the standpoint of the, the people that, own this real estate and lease these buildings. Uh, uh, the the retail center owner, everybody. Well, you know, a lot of people say, well, this, the weakest sector in real estate right now is, is retail, uh, uh, just because the pandemic's been so tough on them, uh, at least on a national basis. But that's uh, what about the owners of these properties, owners of the centers? That how are they doing? Um, are they, I'm sure there's delinquency is and paying rent is up and everything. So how, how, what's it like to be a retail center landlord these days? Yeah, you know, the first few months of the pandemic, I think it was pretty uncertain and frightening for a lot of the owners and everybody I think was working the best they could with tenants, deferring rent, forgiving rent, um, you know, just a mix of all that, just to keep people afloat. But the past few months, I've heard from several people saying that's pretty much all stabilized. There's very little of that going on anymore. 
leasing activities up, calls, uh, inquiries into spaces, uh, lease spaces are up. So I feel like from just talking out there on the street with folks that at least for now, everybody feels like the worst is behind them. Activity certainly picked up and they're not dealing with all those um, kind of emergency issues they were dealing with the first three or four months of the pandemic. So nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. But right now, most people are feeling a lot better, a lot better than they did three or four months ago. Right. With the vaccines uh, come, becoming available, um, that's that's hopeful. That's hopeful. You know, after we've been waiting for that for, for a long time, and it, it came faster than I thought it would. I have to admit, but still, um, it's uh, it offers some hope there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. So I do think unless something out of left field comes again, I think. I think we'll be okay for the most part. I really do. And you know how it is with retailers and restaurants where by the time they sign a lease, they're not going to be open for four to nine months, maybe. So I think a lot of people have taken that into consideration too. Well, you just named several leases you've got lately. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, you know, the, the, you know, I would say probably the most prominent, corner in, in, in the Montrose area, Westheimer and Montrose Boulevard. And we, we had the big sale, a $27 million deal, a couple of, I guess it's August, I think they was announced that uh, Madison Marquette sold it to, to Skanska. You know, it's, it's almost three acres. Uh, it's got a strip center there now with specs and I guess, um, you know, the books, uh, the, book, the bookstore um, but hey, that's, I paid twenty-seven million dollars for less than three acres. Um, you know they're going to do something. But you're going to have to build something pretty fabulous to, to justify spending that much money on it. Yeah, no, it's going to be more than a food truck park for sure. Um, so I was talking to Carlos um, Cacone. Hope I didn't screw up his last name and the pronunciation, but he's one of the guys over the development. And honestly, I'm really excited that they got a hold of that property because they have a lot of money to really do something special there. And it is the epicenter of the whole market area. I mean, that is the it and it of, of Montrose. And they really care. They're not in a hurry and they want to do obviously what's best for them. But I, I do think they care a lot about the neighborhood. They really do. So, they're going to knock down the entire project first quarter and just raise it and then do something temporary for maybe a year and a half to two years, just to let the market percolate, see what they think ends up being the best use there. But in the meantime, they're talking about a couple of really cool temporary concepts. One was a farmer's market, but the most recent one he told me would maybe be a drive-in, which would be yeah. really cool. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I mean, it'd really be awesome. But he said right now their long-term plan is obviously a big mixed-use um, development where they'll go up. Uh, a lot of retail, a um, maybe a boutique hotel component, which would be great. You know, it's funny, Houston being the fourth largest city in the country, we have very few cool boutique hotels. You know, you have them all over L.A. and, and New York, but Houston has very few. So I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. And then thinking about office believe it or not, new office construction, but they want to cater towards maybe the high tech area, maybe piggyback a little bit off the old, uh, the, the ION development in Midtown. So that's their plan right now. Um, but as I said, I, I couldn't figure, I couldn't think of somebody probably better to, to take that on, especially with, um, you know, paying such an expensive price, 230 bucks a foot. That's, that's a record for the area. Um, they have, and, they have deep pockets. <laughs> they have deep yeah. pockets. We don't need a bank loan to do it. You know? <laughs> yes. Not those guys. Skanska, you know, Swedish firm, it, but they have so much money. They're so huge and nation, you know, worldwide company that they 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 pay cash and they, they finance their developments internally a lot of times. They don't need to go begging at a bank. They just 
write a check. Wow. We're going to do it. It's I know. Hard. It's nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's yeah. a nice luxury that we don't have. And I said, why don't you just keep who you have there and just keep them on a month to month if you're not going to develop for a couple of years? And they said, you know, we'd rather just get rid of it. In the past, we've had trouble sometimes getting month to month tenants out. And to your point, they have some three pockets that they can do that. But I think it will be better for the community because, as, as we discussed earlier, they have some really cool temporary concepts. I think it'll be great. And, uh, you know, another reason I feel so good about them is that you may know I'm on the board of Covenant House, which is just behind that, which is the homeless. Um, it's a place that we help home Houston's home homeless youth. Um, mm -hmm. I get a plug in if you want to donate to a great cause. CovenantHouseHouston.org, wonderful organization. But, you know, they want to know what's going on in the neighborhood. They were talking about maybe hiring some of the Covenant House kids for some of these temporary concepts. They they really want to do the right thing and be involved. So, again, um, I'm just super excited to have them is heading up the project. It sounds phenomenal. The uh, uh, what, What's about the Tower Theater there uh, in the next block? We uh, haven't heard much about it lately. What's going on there? Well, that's where the Acme Oil, uh, <laughs> well, uh, Houston Freudian Slip, Acme Oyster House is going. Oh, where okay. El Rey. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, they're a pretty neat outfit out of New Orleans, and they're building out right now. That'll be good. That'll be good. Yeah, it's yeah. A, that was that's a huge dining room, too. It was when, you know, the the Mexican food place with their guy, a lot of, a lot of seats, <laughs> but yeah, cool. well, that's great. I'd be glad to see that. Uh, see what it's glad to have it not empty. And that, that sounds like a good use. Good use. Uh, mm -hmm. The other yeah. thing we're right there in that area, of course, is that where they call them the Montrose Collective, uh, that be the, you know, like on the north side of the street, on the, on the east side of Montrose Boulevard, kind of the northeast corner, Ushi's that is there in the old Felix Mexican restaurant, the historic Felix mm -hmm. Mexican projects. Uh, been there for right. a long time. Of course, they're building a lot of new stuff, but mid-rise office and retail and, and things. Tell us what you know about the, the collective, Montrose Collective. Yeah, sure. So as you probably know, Steve Radome is developing it and Steve's a great guy. And, and he's another one who just really, of course, we all want to make money in this business, but he really cares about doing the right thing, blending in with the community, putting something there that's, um, you know, that goes. And I walked through it with him a couple of weeks ago. And again, I, I sound like a broken record, but he's perfect for putting up a building like that too. There's gonna to be a ton of open green space. It's gonna be very um, kind of contemporary, but go with the area. And it's, you know, it, it's a mixed use project, obviously. He signed a big office lease with Live Nation. And then he's gonna have a fair amount of retail as well. You know, the new development, I think the retail has been a little slower just because of COVID but I know he's making some decent headway. Um, and I think at the end of the day, he'll do very well with that project. Um, it's a wonderful location and um, he's a great developer. So in the long run, I think it'll be great. It'll just take a little longer, I think, than all of us would have had, had hoped in initially. They, they topped that out a couple of months ago, putting the beam on the, to symbolize that they've, Made a lot of progress in construction, so I guess it'll be open maybe by next summer or something. Um, yeah, I think that's about right. And he's got a lot of parking too, which is nice for the yeah. project because it pretty much has to self park, and uh, he's got a lot of underground parking there. Oh, that's great. That's, yeah, parking is one thing that Montrose has a shortage of. You know, with parking. Yes, a lot of a lot of places. A lot of places do. Yeah, and the Kroger. Uh, what's going on with the Kroger back there? Um, you know, but, I don't know. I, I think the CIA must the CIA must be involved because I cannot find out anything. Um, oh. I finally got a hold of the Kroger real estate person, or maybe the assistant to the real estate person in Cincinnati, and I said, "Hey, 
is it for sale? Is there a price? Can anybody put a backup offer in? And after five or six persistent emails and calls, I finally got a response that said, sorry, we've been busy, but it's under contract. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that was it. And I said, well, thank you. But will you take backup offers? Was there asking price? And she said, I'm sorry, I, we, we can't give you any of that information, basically. So I don't know what's going on. It's a very odd deal that, the, you know, for a public company, they're not really disclosing much information about anything. So I'm just trying to keep my ear to the ground and, and find out what the what the future is. But nobody seems to know, and they're keeping a pretty tight lip. Well, let us know if you hear something. Yeah, yeah I will. We talked the other day uh, about you know, the village, the next to Rice University, but Kirby Drive and University Boulevard and that whole area that has been um, just kind of organically started growing in like 1938 or something. And, and now it's uh, been through a lot of changes. And you got, of course, Rice University um, Management Company who manages the endowment for, for the university owns a lot of stuff in there, but not everything. Uh, what, what's your take on the, on the village? Yeah, the village is really interesting. You know, if you walk through it lately, it almost feels like a bomb went off a little bit in the sense that there's, it, it feels like there's historic vacancy there, particularly in uh, a lot of the non Rice University owned properties. Um, which is a smattering of different owners throughout the village. And I think it's a little bit of what we talked about earlier where the weak folks were maybe already kind of weak and then the COVID just did them in because the village probably had more mom and pops than any little concentrated area in the city. So I just think between Amazon and everything else we all know that has been made it that's made it difficult for the mama pops. I think a lot of them were just on, you know, with, on fumes and then this sort of did them in, unfortunately. So it, it feels like there's 25, 30% vacancy at least. That's what it feels like just walking around. There's been a few temporary tenants that have popped up that make it feel a little better, but it's, it's really struggling. Now, that being said, there's been several new leases that have been signed. Um, you're probably aware of, you know, West Elm is going into the old urban outfitter space. CB2 is going in. Um, Scott Rubenstein, we developed the old uh, BW Wings and Velvet Tacos going in, uh, the majority of that space. The old Pier 1, uh, there's a vet clinic, uh, veterinarian clinic going in there. So there is some new activity with some of the bigger spaces, but the smaller mom and pops, it's it's rough. It's really rough. Yeah. I know that, you know, the food hall um, in there, um, I think Times Boulevard and Kelvin or something like that, uh, uh, they're gone. It looked like to me when I drove by there recently that they did survive the pandemic or something. And there was no activity there. Yeah, no, they, they closed. And I think the pandemic certainly didn't help it because if you walked in, there were seven or eight different concepts. It was all open air and, and it was a cool concept, but certainly that does not work well in a pandemic setting. Yeah. So just to, uh, speaking of rice management, uh, you know, the ION uh, down there in the, the old Sears building. Don't tell, we, let's talk about that project and what's going on there. Yeah. It, well, overall, I'm really excited because, you know, you're such a big proponent of what do we need to keep Houston on the cutting edge and bring new business in and, and keep us relevant. Um, and I think that's something that we have needed desperately is sort of some sort of high tech attractive or attraction to bring that element into Houston in a big way. So I think it's a, a, a great idea. Um, I don't know of a lot of activity yet that's happened. I read a couple of announcements in the paper recently, but I think in the long term, it's, it's awesome. Bryce is buying up lots of tracks around the ION too. And as you probably know, they already own a lot of the property. So I think long term for Houston, uh, for Houston, it's, it's 
fabulous. I really think that um, the city stepped up in combination with Rise to to make this happen, and we absolutely needed it. Um, you know, your articles I always love about why Austin got Tesla. How come we weren't in the running for them and lots of other folks? Which is a great question, and I think this is one wonderful step to try to go in the right direction of getting a lot of those high tech companies and folks, which is, you know, that's, that's a big part of the future. We all know it. It is a, a great, you know, it looks to me from what I've seen, it's like, it's going to be a really fantastic remodeling renovation. They, you know, you have these big humongous Sears floors that, but they went in and basically like chopped a whole big square, Square hole all the way down, so you have an atrium in effect going down to the basement and everything, uh, which I think was a smart move. And I think it's going to be cool. You know, I get I, I wonder about some of the you know they, you know, big mysteries. I, I haven't figured out their PR plan. And I'm going to take the PR people to task because <laughs> they they keep saying that. Press releases about oh we, we we Chevron's committed to being a tenant and last week is Microsoft's committed to being a tenant and they won't tell the square footage of their leases we don't know if we're talking about hey they're going to have 500 feet or something you know so a little transparency on the on the square footage man <laughs> that's that's my that's my uh, they're going to be having to answer that question in in 2021. Um, yeah, but well, that's why that's why you're, that's why you're a good reporter. You you want the de the important details, but uh, I, I do think. Um, hey, we got we got Microsoft as a tenant. Well, okay. <laughs> it does make a good headline. But, we but uh, yeah. yeah, another positive, you know, that Midtown area has always kind of struggled. You know, it's 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 not been great, and so you know the the cherry on top is that. That whole area is is obviously being improved tremendously, which is just great too, because it, it struggled over, well, forever. Frankly, it, it, it hasn't been great for decades now. No, they they uh, you know they really had some homeless issues that they underneath the freeway, they closed it down um, and tried to because the density was just too heavy and it wasn't. It wasn't safe in a lot of different ways and that you know and it was the huge problem what do you do with these people and um how can we solve this social issue it's it's a big one and everybody's concerned about it and and there's got to be a better way to get things done but it's not an easy problem to solve i know no it's not but i, I think houston is a little bit more on the forefront of helping with that than a lot of the other major cities. Um, I don't think we have the problem that the Portland's and Seattle's and San Francisco's have, or LA's for that matter. And in fact, even though to the sort of naked eye, it looks bad, I think our homeless population is actually down from what it has been in the past, although it's hard to measure, admittedly. But, uh, you know, the city really does a lot. And there's a new development on FAN called the ReCenter that uh, recently opened. And they serve primarily um, sort of alcoholic, drug abuse type folks. And they stay there and rehabilitate them. It's a beautiful building, brand new. And it's, they own almost uh, a block, a block and a half over there. So, um, not to get off the subject, but I do think Houston really does a good job in trying to combat a very um, difficult problem. Yeah, you feel sorry for those people, and but you, it takes takes a lot to know how to help. <laughs> it, yeah, it's not automatic to help them. It's, it's it takes some people that know what they're doing and figured this thing out a little bit better than than I had. Um, the, I, I know, I think, weren't you like president of the museum district, you know, business council or, or 
at one time. Uh, uh, in the, I was just thinking about the, the new museum, that uh, the new uh, expansion to the Museum of Fine Arts that has opened. Have you had a chance to take a look at that? Uh, no, I haven't. Just you know, I've, I've read about it and I haven't been over there yet, but I, I can't wait. I mean, it's really, it looks like a, just an amazing project and the amount of money they put over there, put into it. And, and uh, I mean, it's really going to make, I think, Houston have one of the first class museum districts in the whole country. I mean, it's just, it's just an amazing project. Um, and again, you know, it just, Houston is great. I mean, the people, care so much, uh, particularly the people with money, which is extra nice, whether it's putting money into the museum or the improvements on the bayou with all the bike trails, or even as we were talking about helping the homeless. I mean, I do think that we sort of have this um, spirit and uh, um, thought of philanthropy that is special, I think, relative to a lot of other places around the country. Yeah, the, after you know Hurricane Harvey, Oh, the, that disaster, um, it was uh, pretty amazing. It's the way that we heal from that. All these people step forward to help during that. And, you know, you had all these people from different backgrounds, you know, guys with their bass boats coming out and <laughs> right. viewing people off the roofs, you know, it's like pretty heroic, you know, the, the uh, so I, I think it was really a unifying thing the way we we pulled together for that tragedy. It was pretty yeah, tough. I agree. Yeah, the whole Montrose Museum District. I mean, th there's just so much going on, and you know, the museum's always been there, and they've done a wonderful job of even making a really good museum, really a great museum. But sort of the Montrose Westheimer corridor. For a long time, it's just sort of been a real mixed bag. And I think a lot of us who've been here a while just knew that it wasn't a question of if it was just when. And I really feel like the when is here, you know? I mean, between again, Steve's project and Skansis project and all the other new activity, it's really kind of our South Congress, you know, that area. It's the only part of town that sort of has that special vibe and character. And yeah. it seems yeah. like now, the South Congress in Austin, Texas. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Which is exciting. And now there's a TERS and they're going to be throwing some money over there as well to help with lots of things, whether it's traffic signals or infrastructure or sidewalks or, you know, affordable housing. There's lots of things they're studying now to figure out where to spend the money. And that's going to be a big plus too, I think. What other areas are, do we, around town, uh, are you, you keeping your eye on for the future? Um, what do you, uh, anything that's being overlooked that uh, somebody needs to pay attention to, make an investment in? You know, not, nothing really comes to mind. We do do things all over town, but we try to be the, the go-to folks for the inside the loop commercial stuff. And um, I guess I'm biased, but, but I would say, I think the inside the loop activity it is the most exciting. And I don't know if you look at, I've heard some people say there's a little bit of an exodus to suburbia because mm -hmm. of traffic and well, maybe let me back up. It's cheaper out there, obviously. And maybe with telecommuting a lot, just what we're doing now with zoom, you know, it's not a big deal anymore for people to live in suburbia as much. And there's probably some truth to that. You know, I, I get it. And the schools uh, tend to be better out there as well. The public schools, which is a big deal. But I just think the inner loop has so much to offer because of the uniqueness and the vibrancy. I mean, I use this example all the time, and I don't mean to be disparaging to the suburbs because there's, there's great suburbs in Houston. But, you know, sometimes I feel like if you were dropped from a helicopter and you didn't know where you were and you were blindfolded and you landed somewhere outside the loop, you might not know if you're in Houston or you could be in uh, Tulsa or you could be in, you know, Cleveland, just, just, you know, any other nice suburban area, but inside the loop, you know, you're inside the loop, 
it's 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 got the the kind of vibe and the character and the mix of people, retailers, restaurants. Um, it's a little more walkable as much as walk, uh, walkable Houston could be. So I think people like that. And I think there's always going to be a pull for that. Um, so I do feel like in the long term, particularly with the medical center so close and we know what's going on over there and, and, and downtown is never going to go away. So there's so many things that pull folks in because of that, if if they can afford it, which is another whole, you know, podcast on um, pricing people out, which is not a good thing at all because land's gotten so crazy expensive and, and that's a bad thing. Well, well, 2021 is here. Uh, what do we, what do you predict? What do you think is going to happen this year, 2021? You know, <laughs> I'm always hesitant to give predictions because you know what they say. Uh, they talk about monkeys throwing darts at a dartboard and then people predicting the stock market and the monkeys do just as good as the people predicting the stock market. So I, I, I really don't think uh, anybody really knows. But if you're going to make me guess. Uh, yeah, you got to guess. I, <laughs> I think the consensus is it's going to be a really good year because there's just so pent up, so much pent up demand of people wanting to get out and go crazy. And people have saved a lot of money because they haven't been able to go out. Those that have been fortunate enough to save and, and kept their jobs. So I think that there's going to be a little bit of a, you know, let's go crazy and swing from the chandeliers a little bit. And um, I think it's going to be a pretty good year once, once the smoke clears. I, I really do. Okay, we've been with Mark Davis, Davis Commercial, and we thank you, Mark, for taking time to be with us and sharing your thoughts and wisdom today. And we be sure to check us out, realtynewsreport.com. It's on the internet, password free. It's a lot of news there, and we'll have a, this interview as podcast will be posted there uh, also. So. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. Mark, thank you for participating and helping us out today. Well, thank you, Ralph. I appreciate it. I love reading your uh, blog, and uh, I appreciate the, the 30 minutes of fame. <laughs> All right, my friend. <laughs>